All right. So, so, so given there, there may be some scenarios where you do truly have presence in more than one a cloud. Uh, here, this is a legitimate question now. What is wrong with the cloud network design that focuses just on IP transport, thoughtful WAN connectivity? In other words, just stitching networks together like we always have. Why do we need a special multi-cloud networking product? Because there seems to be more and more of them coming up. Oh, because people believe in Santa Claus. <laughs> No, honestly, uh, Ethan, uh, <laughs> let's say you want to, you know, get from place to place. Uh, and today, I don't know how it's in US, but in some parts of Europe, public transport is mostly shut down because of the pandemic. I can't fly anywhere. So driving is like your only option. Let's assume that. So you have two options. You either learn how to drive or you buy a chauffeur service. And multi-cloud products are just that. You're you outsourcing. can't grasp the yeah. nuances of AWS networking and Azure networking, and you are afraid of that because you, know, you have no clue what you're dealing with. And someone comes along saying, oh, don't worry. We build this abstraction layer on top of that and you won't even know that you are in Azure and AWS. Then of course you go for that. Common control and management plane, yes. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> You're so unimpressed. <laughs> now you see the, the problem is that there are like three different ways of solving this problem. Option number one is what Terraform does, which is, is the same product. It uh, has the same configuration language, but it has different providers for AWS and Azure and GCP and yeah. VMware NSX and whatever. So you can use the same tool to deploy on AWS and Azure, but you cannot take your AWS deployment recipe and deploy it on Azure absolutely no way. Second option is that you really have this abstraction layer that some people are selling you. And then if you want this thingy to work across all clouds, you are by definition down to the least common denominator. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can only do stuff that you can do in all clouds which is like basic IP and basic VPN and maybe packet filters with security groups. Mm -hmm. So why bother? I mean, you could learn that with Azure and AWS and GCP anyway. And the third option is that the vendor is trying to get away from these uh, discrepancies in functionality of public clouds by deploying their own VMs. Mm -hmm. Now, sending data through a VM tends to be built. Yes. Certainly can be. Yeah. At well, least the it VM usually itself. is. Yeah. They build everything. <laughs> and that thingy is burning CPU cycles. Yeah. And that thingy is bandwidth limited. Based mm -hmm. on what instance you buy, you get this much bandwidth. So do you really want to put all those limitations in your design just because you couldn't be bothered to grow to skill sets? And you will still have to grow the abstraction tool skill set anyway. So, okay. So you're, so far we've been shooting holes in everything. So first of yeah, all, it's sorry, a dumb idea to job. have to do it to, to begin with. <laughs> so it's a dumb idea to have to do it to begin with. Uh, second of all, if you do have to do it, using a multi-cloud networking product that's you know specially designed for this means it's going to be kind of limited, and maybe it's got an operational advantage. You've only got you know the one abstraction layer that you have to interact with, and it'll take care of the rest. But right now we're down to the least common denominator, whatever is common across the cloud. So that's pretty limiting. We could stand up a VM, you know, running a, a virtual network appliance of some kind, but then it's like any other workload that runs there. It, it tends to be expensive. And in the case of something like an SD-WAN virtual appliance, which is a, 
I think a pr pretty common model, extend your SD-WAN fabric into the cloud by standing up a virtual appliance from your SD-WAN provider. Well, now you've got however much heft you need for that CPU. It's not going to be a light lift and the thing's going to do encryption, you know, in and out all the time. So, But by the way, the SD-WAN appliance is like the only thing that makes sense. Mm. As far as, um, well, for, yeah, because, so, so uh, from a multi-cloud perspective, if you do it that way, it's kind of, a, it kind of levels the playing field. Yeah, and, and you, also, you if, if you decide to go for SD-WAN, it's the simplest possible scenario if you make your cloud regions just an other, just extra points in your SD-WAN when set up anyway. But to go back I mean, to your earlier point, there is an expense there. Yeah, um, but you have to terminate uh, those SD-WAN sessions somewhere anyway. Yeah. yeah. Right. And if you deploy the appliance, the virtual appliance version of whatever SD-WAN provider you've gone with, now you've got that commonality between your different clouds. Yeah. And you can, once the traffic egresses from that appliance into your VPC or whatever, now you're dealing with the native cloud construct of wherever you are, and you're not subject to that least common denominator. Exactly. So your WAN site is solved by the SD-WAN provider. Your LAN, if you wish, site is solved by your cloud provider. And that's it. Almost. Oh, almost. Oh, okay. Tell me what the no. almost is. <laughs> now, the problem is that uh, you wouldn't want to have one SD-WAN appliance, right? I mean, no. you could. And if it crashes, uh, then your Lambdas in AWS or CloudWatch or what, whatever they have, it will eventually notice that your SD-WAN appliance is no longer reachable and it will restart the appliance and the appliance will be restarted. And three minutes later, you're back in business. Supposedly, some people care about those three minutes. Yeah, supposedly. Mm. Now, if you're running a single database instance in the background, I don't know why you care about those three minutes, but you know, different team. It's okay for the other team to fall over and be down for a day, but network has to be up 99.99% .99 of the time, right? Right. Just so we can't be blamed because we would be blamed anyway. <laughs> You're feeling extra cynical today. And in fairness no, to you, Ron, that's my a, usual it is a Friday story. evening for him as we're recording this. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh, anyway, so you would want to have two SD-WAN appliances. And uh, in a traditional LAN environment, you would use uh, HSRP or VRRP or whatever between them. And you would use some routing protocol or they would run OSPF or BGP with your LAN site to insert the routes that they get from SD-WAN into your local environment, right? No. That doesn't work in public clouds. Because right. in public clouds, uh, there is no HSRP, there is no layer two, there is no IP address failover. There is no routing protocol between a VM and the cloud because those people are sane as opposed to some virtualization vendors that we will not name. <laughs> Just heavily <And> imply. <laughs> I'm not saying anything today. We are, that would be a different podcast. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so how do you get that those two appliances to work you know, in that scenario? And now we get to crazy schemes that involve at least one load balancer. Well, two load balancers, of <laughs> course. <laughs> no, but uh, cloud providers are usually handling that. So you deploy the load balancer with a proper service level and they guarantee that it will meet the service level. At least Azure does it. Uh, or you use the network load balancer in AWS because that's actually distributed. So it's not an appliance. It is sitting somewhere in the cloud. So it's not a single instance that could fail. Anyway, uh, you have to present those two appliances as a single thingy, at least to the inside and maybe to the outside as well. That depends on how the SD-WAN 
part of the whole thing is working. Yeah. And uh, then, of course, uh, you have to put them in a separate subnet so that the load balancer can reach them. And then if you're receiving routes from the SD-WAN controller, you need to use the cloud API to insert those routes into the cloud routing tables so that at least the load balancer knows how to get to the outside world versus the uh, SD-WAN appliances. So it's a nice convoluted spaghetti mess. <laughs> yeah, that's a nice way of putting it. I, I yeah. was uh, part of a deployment that was setting up the Citrix virtual net scalers in an Azure environment. And this was very early on in their figuring this all out. So we were literally working with like the Netscaler team trying to figure out, okay, how do I get them highly available? And the answer eventually was you need two load balancers, one on the front and one on the back. Yes. And the one on the front had a public IP address and the one on the back had an internal IP address. And you had two NICs in the Netscalers that talked to those different load balancers. And it got really complicated very fast. And of course, they had no templates or anything for the deployment. So we were just like doing this as they figured it out. And I got to say, the HA did not work well at first at all. Yes. <laughs> so the one thing I can say is I'm so sorry.